With the P-47 Thunderbolt, the United States Army Air Forces didn't just get a good fighter, they got a winner. A big one. A blunt one. The kind of airplane that looks less like a duelist and more like a brawler that showed up to the fight in work boots. It was a big brute, a big jug, a full-on juggernaut. And the nickname fit because everything about it felt oversized, overbuilt, and unapologetically American. Start with the heart of the thing, that huge Pratt & Whitney double wasp radial up front, pulling like a freight train and giving the Thunderbolt the kind of confidence that pilots remember for the rest of their lives. Then look at the hands it fought with. 8.50 caliber machine guns. Not two, not four, eight. When the Thunderbolt opened up, it didn't poke holes. It could turn targets into mincemeat, the kind of firepower that made enemy aircraft think twice and made anything on the ground regret being in the wrong place at the wrong time. And that's the part people sometimes miss. The P-47 wasn't a one-trick pony. It could go toe-to-toe -to -toe in a dogfight across most altitude ranges and then, without changing its personality, come down and shred ground forces with a level of attack capability that felt downright unfair. It was a fighter that could hunt airplanes, then hunt trucks, then hunt trains, whatever the day demanded. But the most legendary trait wasn't speed or style. It was toughness. The Thunderbolt could suck up stupid amounts of punishment and keep flying, like a flying tank that refused to quit. You didn't just sit in a P-47. You strapped into a machine that dared the enemy to try and usually survived the attempt. But here's the thing about having a winner in wartime. The enemy doesn't stop reading your scoreboard. The moment the P-47 proved it could run with the best, the clock started ticking because fighters on the other side weren't standing still either. New models, better climb, better speed, sharper performance as the months rolled on. And if the jug was going to keep its edge, it couldn't just be good enough. It had to keep getting better, even while the war was already demanding everything the factories could give. That pressure is what pushed the USAAF and Republic into the what else can we wring out of this airframe mindset? In a previous effort, the Air Forces had even looked at the XP-47H concept, an attempt to chase more performance by moving to a liquid-cooled engine, basically asking the Thunderbolt to trade some of its radial simplicity for a different kind of speed potential. It was a logical question for the era. Change the heart, change the results. But the XP-47J took a different path one that feels almost more American in spirit. Instead of abandoning the radial, it said, keep the big round engine and optimize everything around it. Tighten the airflow, clean up the shape, cut weight wherever it doesn't earn its keep, push the power plant harder, smarter, and cleaner. In other words, don't replace the jug's personality, supercharge it. And once you accept that premise, the next question becomes impossible to ignore. How fast can a Thunderbolt really go if you build it like you mean it? Now, if you're going to chase a real performance leap without reinventing the entire airplane, you don't start with a paint job. You start where the Thunderbolt always started, the engine. For the XP-47J, Republic swapped in a Pratt & Whitney R2857C radial. On paper, it carried a standard rated output of 2,100 horsepower, already serious muscle. But the whole point of this experiment was to see what the airframe could take when the gloves came off. In war emergency power, that same engine could be pushed to 2,800 horsepower. That's not a tweak. That's Republic looking at a proven fighter and saying, let's turn the volume knob until the dial bends. But horsepower is only half the story. The other half is how cleanly you can feed it air, cool it, and slice through the sky. A stock P-47's radial is cooled by direct airflow. It works, but it's not the sleekest solution when you're chasing every last mile per hour. 
the XP-47J went the opposite direction. It wore a tight, close-fitting cowling that enclosed the engine more cleanly. To make that possible, cooling had to be handled differently. So Republic added an intake fan and a new chin scoop under the nose, an airplane jawline that wasn't there for looks. It was there to keep that boosted radial alive while the aircraft ran harder than a standard jug ever would. And because the Thunderbolt's whole high-performance identity was tied to boost, the XP-47J also needed to keep its turbocharged lungs wide open. So new inlets were fitted to supply air to the turbo supercharger system. In plain terms, they didn't just give it more power. They worked to make sure the power could actually be used without choking the airplane or cooking it. Then there's a detail that aviation people love because it feels almost like cheating, the exhaust. Republic altered the exhaust system so it vented out through ventral outlets, exits under the belly, set up in a way that could provide additional thrust. Not rocket booster thrust, but the kind of free push that matters when your entire project is about stacking small advantages until the numbers finally break through. Of course, speed isn't just about making more power. It's about not wasting it. So the XP-47J went on a strict diet. Armament was cut from the classic Thunderbolt's eight guns down to six Browning machine guns in the wings, and ammunition was reduced to 267 rounds per gun. The rear fuel tank was removed. The radio equipment was pulled out too. And to keep the airframe as aerodynamically clean as possible, there was no provision for external ordnance or drop tanks. No bombs, no racks, no hanging clutter. Just the airplane stripped down and sharpened for one job. Go fast. And then you get to the propeller plan, the one that sounds perfect on a drawing board. Republic originally hoped to fit a contra-rotating propeller system to the XP-47J, a setup designed to turn more power into forward bite without the usual drawbacks. But delays hit, the schedule slipped, and the decision was made to shelve the idea for the second prototype, which was supposed to become the test bed for that system. The catch? That second airplane ultimately never got built. So the Superbolt that actually flew did it without the prop concept that was meant to be its final ace. All that surgery, power, cooling, airflow, weight loss, added up to one simple, brutal advantage. The XP-47J was lighter. Republic shaved about 1,000 pounds off the standard P-47D's empty weight. And if you've spent any time around performance machines, you already know what that means. Less weight for the same kind of power isn't just better, it's a different animal. The airplane doesn't have to work as hard to accelerate, to climb, to hold speed. It stops feeling like a flying anvil and starts feeling, at least by P-47 standards, almost sharp. And once Republic saw that the basic idea worked, they went hunting for the ceiling. In July 1944, they decided to see just how far they could push the Superbolt and fitted it with a new propeller and a General Electric CH-5 turbo supercharger. This wasn't casual tinkering. This was the turn every knob to the right phase. Then came the number that still makes people sit up straight. In August 1944, flying over a calibrated course, a Republic test pilot reportedly measured a top speed of 505 miles per hour. Read that again. 505. In a prop-driven fighter. If that figure's number held, it wasn't just fast for a Thunderbolt. It was fast, period. The fastest piston-engined fighter ever built. And it wasn't only about top speed, either. The climb performance was just as wild. The XP-47J was said to be capable of reaching 30,000 feet in 6 minutes and 45 seconds. 
That kind of rate changes the whole conversation about interceptors, because now you're not chasing the enemy, you're meeting them. So yes, the nickname Superbolt suddenly didn't feel like marketing, it felt earned. But the video doesn't let you stay in the fantasy for long, because aviation history is full of great numbers that come with small print. Those headline results were never replicated, and that matters. When the USAAF took possession of the aircraft in December 1944 and ran their own test program, they only ever achieved a top speed of 484 miles per hour. Still extremely fast, still impressive, but not the mythic 505. And even that 484 came with a price tag. It was achieved at the cost of an exhaust manifold failure. In other words, the Superbolt could run like a record breaker, but it was starting to break like one too. And this is where the Superbolt story turns into the most familiar kind of wartime tragedy. The airplane is brilliant, the numbers are exciting, and reality still wins. First, the technical side. The XP-47J was pushing the envelope hard enough that problems weren't a surprise, they were practically part of the deal. The engine suffered so much wear that it had to be replaced after roughly 10 hours of flight testing. 10 hours. That's not maintenance intensive, that's a warning label. And when you're talking about turning a one-off prototype into a frontline tool, that kind of wear isn't just inconvenient, it's disqualifying. Then there's the second prototype, the one that was supposed to carry the project's final form including the contra-rotating propeller system. It never got built. Part of that was simple. Pratt and Whitney never sorted out the issues with that specialized contra-rotating setup, and delays kept stacking up. But the bigger reason was strategic and painfully practical. Republic itself rapidly lost interest in the idea of a production P-47J. On paper, the dream was clean. The J model would be an improved Thunderbolt that could roll off the existing P-47 production lines with minimal disruption. Keep building what works, just faster. But once the engineers did the honest math, the dream collapsed. Only about 30% of the XP-47J was actually the same as a standard P-47D. That meant switching to J model production wouldn't be a simple upgrade it would require major retooling, and it would do it at exactly the worst possible time, when the demand for fighters was at its absolute peak. And in that environment, a hard question shows up fast. If the P-47D was already more than adequate for the job at hand, why mess around with the line? Republic had another answer ready, and it was bigger than the Superbolt. As early as July 1943, they were already issuing reports suggesting that the XP-47J likely wouldn't be worth the effort, and that the smarter move was to divert resources and USAAF money into the next generation fighter, the XP-72 Ultra Bolt. The USAAF agreed with that assessment, and the decision followed naturally cancel the second prototype and move on. The irony is cruel and perfectly timed to the era. Even the XP-72, with all that promise, never reached service, because jets arrived fast enough to slam the door on the piston engine fighter age before the Ultrabolt could become the future it was designed for. So no, the XP-47J didn't go to war. It never became a squadron mount. It never got the chance to prove itself over Europe the way the standard jug did. But it also wasn't a wasted effort, because the Superbolt's real job was to be a test bed, a flying laboratory that taught Republic what the Thunderbolt airframe could handle when you chased extreme speed. And those lessons didn't just vanish into a filing cabinet. They ran alongside and fed into the XP-47M effort, an unofficial development track that took a more practical approach. 
use the R2800 C Series engine experience and apply what Republic learned working with the CH5 Turbo without rewriting the airplane from scratch. Then, history handed them a reason to move fast. When the V-1 flying bombs began hitting the United Kingdom in June 1944, the need for an extremely fast interceptor became urgent. Because Republic already had real-world knowledge from the Superbolt program, they were able to turn out 130 P-47M aircraft in reasonably short order. They didn't arrive soon enough to make a major dent in the doodlebug crisis, but they did earn a different kind of reputation. In the telling that matters here, the XP-47J keeps the crown as the fastest piston-engined fighter ever built, while the P-47M holds the frontline accolade as the fastest piston-engined aircraft to see service in World War II. That's a legacy, just not the one most people expect.